Uh, the doctor will not prescribe you all the time penicillin. Uh, depending on the disease that you have, the doctor has to prescribe you a medication that is uh, good for you and, and, and of course that won't harm you. And this is what I want to talk about and I want uh, you to see us as doctors. We are doctors, we are orthodontists. We correct malocclusions. We are not technicians. When, the, when my students or when some doctors ask me what technique do you use, I say I am not a technician, I am a doctor, so we use a therapy. And today I want to show you uh, what I'm doing at my clinic, at my, at, at my practice, private practice, with the, at this Seva uh, game bracket. So, without any more delay, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about me. Uh, I am from Mexico City. My, my grandfather, rest in peace, he, he was Lebanese and he came to Mexico in 1938, like many, you know, Palestinian and Lebanese immigrants, they go to America. So I got my dental degree in the uni Intercontinental University, my uh, li uh, as well as my you know my license of dentist, and then I did my uh, uh, postgraduate program, my specialty in Loma Linda University in the United States, and uh, Loma Linda is located one hour from the from Los Angeles, one hour to the to the east, and this is the hospital of Loma Linda. And uh, they have here the, also the medicine, the, the University of uh, Medical Sciences. And Loma Linda is very well known uh, worldwide because this, uh, the Children's Hospital, it was the first uh, hospital that they made a heart transplant to a newborn baby. They actually took a heart from a monkey and they put it on, uh, on the, and they transplanted on, on a baby and uh, it was successful. So. It's very well known for doing heart transplants and also it's well known because they developed a proton beam that if a patient has a cancer cyst that is located and it has not been metastasized, uh, they put this proton beam into this cyst, cancer cyst and it's 100% curable. So this is the Loma Linda Hospital. And the motto of the university is the Good Samaritan. And here, what you're seeing, this is a dental school, and here they used to be the orthodontic program. But nowadays, um, one, of my, one of my teachers, one of my professors was Dr. Robert M. Ricketts. And uh, if you think about it, what Dr. Ricketts gave to the orthodontic community and to what he gave to us, it was great. So he was named the father of modern orthodontics. Uh, like, you know, Dr. Edward H. Angle is the father of orthodontics, but Ricketts is the father of modern orthodontics because he developed not only a cephalometric um, analysis, but also he had his own prescription. And Ricketts, in his book, he tells us exactly how many grams you need to move a tooth, how many grams you need to make an intrusion, how many grams you need to do extrusion, and also how many gram, uh, grams you need to expand. So. It was uh, great that Dr. Ricketts came to the clinic and during my specialty in Loma Linda. I was there for two and a half years and he came every month to the clinic and to give us lectures. And now this is the um, orthodontic building. That This is the ortho program in Loma Linda. It's across the street from the university. And uh, sometimes now I go there. I've been already guiding uh, two research projects of the students and uh, every time they invite me in February to the alumni meeting, I, I, I go there and, and visit my teachers and, and the students. So what we're going to talk about is why another prescription? You know, in orthodontics, you know Roth prescription, Andrew's prescription, Alexander prescription, Ricketts prescription, MBT. But I want to ask you if some of you exactly know the degrees of the centrals of each prescription, the degrees of the laterals, that how many degrees of torque you also have on the cuspids. Do you really know of all the prescriptions? And also, what is the purpose of another bracket system? You know, nowadays they bomb us with this, like I mentioned you, all these marketing products. So we have to use what is not only best for us, what it works with in our hands, but also what it's uh, work, uh, good for our patients. So I am going to go uh, a little bit and share with you why I developed this bracket system and why it's good for our patients. 
And if you think about it in medicine, we always do in dentistry, we try to follow what the people and what the doctors in medicine are doing. So if I went to some journals, some medical journals, and I read this, for example, consideration in the ethnic rhinoplasty, and this was from the, uh, 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 how do you say, journal of plastic surgery. And what they say is that depending on the, of the ethnic group of the patient, they would do the different uh, surgical techniques. Uh, for example, they, uh, in the Caucasian nose, the Caucasian of a lady from the United States, a Caucasian lady, a white, a white ethnic group, uh, their nose is, uh, the cartilage is more, uh, thick and the skin is more thin and for a Latin American lady our cartilage is very thick and I'm sorry the cartilage is very thin and the, but the skin is very is very thick so that they, that they had to use different techniques when doing a rhinoplasty also uh, they had another uh, article the Hispanic rhinoplasty in the United States with emphasis in the Mexican American nose they have also uh, not only in plastic surgery, but also in uh, endocrinology, in the endocrinology uh, journal. They made studies and if, depending on the ethnic group, the secretion of different hormones was different among, uh, like I mentioned, uh, different ethnic groups. Also, change in the estriable. These are the studies that they were made in uh, different medical journals. What, so what I'm trying to tell you here is that we cannot use the same prescription for each patient. Each patient is different and we have to use different prescriptions. And here, uh, what it concerns us in orthodontics is the variation in a clastomal occlusion, comparison of the Mexican mestizos and the American whites. There are also some specific characteristics on the clastomal occlusion when compared uh, the Latin American, for example, a Mexican group that we are white Caucasians, and we also have to uh, address these uh, differences uh, and, uh, in our treatment uh, the, the way we, we are going to use the biomechanics. Now, uh, uh, having said that, uh, I'm going to uh, share with you this article. It was uh, written by Dr. Uh, and published by Dr. Greg Juan, who is uh, the chairman of the ortho program in the University of Washington. He says that in orthodontics we are going uh, to use evidence-based bibliography because we are professionals searching for the truth and the evidence-based approach is the best means to take us in this direction. So my bracket system, this bracket system that I'm, I'm going to talk about is based on cephalometrics, is based on aesthetics and is based on different biomechanics that we're going to use. Now oh, most of you, I don't know if here in Palestine you use, but uh, I use the Ricketts analysis not only because Ricketts was my professor, but I think it's a very complete analysis because it gives you the norms of the patient and how it will change the variation during growth. This is uh, the cephalometric basis. So when I compare the studies uh, with among Caucasian and Latin American uh, patients, I saw that 17 of the 28 measurements of rickets were different when compared the Caucasian with the Latin American uh, patients. Five of them, they were due to dental relationships, and two of them, they had to do to skeletal uh, relationship compensated by the pre-inclination of the teeth, okay? Then I also did a study, not only for the Ricketts analysis, this is the whole Ricketts analysis, most of you know it. Uh, also in the Steiner analysis, I compared the white Americans with the Latin American patients, and what we found is that uh, for the Steiner analysis, nine of the 14 measurements are statistically different. So here also in Palestine, sometimes, if you take the norms of the Caucasian and you compare it with your patients, of course there are going to be many differences. So what I'm trying to tell you is that you cannot compare apples with oranges. You have to compare apples with apples and then you will see uh, what are the true differences that you're having with your patients. So this is just to share the study that I based the, this uh, this uh, prescription. Most of you know the Steiner analysis. I also did a study for the Tweed analysis. And the numbers that you see in green with the asterisk are the numbers that statistically they were different. Now, what I want to emphasize today and the take home message is that you have to be very careful with what interincisal angle you're going to finish your cases. But also be very careful with what interincisal angle you're going to begin with. For example, for the uh, 
uh, Caucasian people, the Indian Saison angle for the Caucasian uh, ethnic group is 131 to 134 degrees. Now, for the Latin American people, our Indian Saison angle is between 120 and 123 degrees. This I mentioned last last uh, last night when I was talking about surgery. Now, tweet tells us that the low in size of 90 degrees, you know, to the uh, in relation to the uh, mandibular plane. Now, 20 degrees, uh, I'm sorry, 90 degrees can be out here, or 90 degrees can be out here. So also, it's very important that you respect the position of the roots. You have to respect the natural position of the roots. Whenever you're applying a torque, you have to be very careful with what prescription you're using, because maybe if you lose, if you are using less torque that the patient already has started with, then you're going to bring the roots out outside of the bone. And this is also the take-home message. Now, just to show you the five uh, most important differences, cephalometric differences, from Caucasians to the um, when compared to the Latin American, and also a little bit of this. Uh, these differences, you are going to find them in your Palestinian patients. You are going to see that for patients, the upper incisor to the Frankfurt plane is of 109 degrees and we have 115 degrees. The upper incisor to the APO line is 3.5 millimeters to 8.4 millimeters. Then the um, lower incisor is 1 millimeter and for us it's almost 4.5 millimeters. In degrees, the lower incisor to the APO is 22 degrees, we have almost 27 degrees. And like Tweed mentioned, you have to have 90 degrees, uh, the lower incisor, uh, to the mandibular plane, and we have 96 degrees. And this is one of the most important. The inter angle is 134, and we have 121. So this, how will it change your treatment plan? And here, this is why I call the topic is extraction or non-extraction. It doesn't matter if you're going to, if you decide to extract or non-extract. Of course, you have to. This decision has to be based on, on on the facial aesthetics of the patient, not on the cephalometric numbers. But if you are going to extract, you have to respect this intraincisional angle, and this is how your mechanics are going to be used, and also how you're going to retract the anterior segment. So in this therapy, in this, is, if this is a therapy, this is not a technique, the way I retract on the extraction cases is I distalize first the cuspid and then I retract the anterior segment. I never, never retract in mass from cuspid to cuspid, and I'm going to show you why. So these are the main uh, differences, and like I mentioned you before, the higher the interincisal angle is, the more retroinclinated the teeth are going to be. And the less that the intercessal angle is going to be, the more good lip support, but the more uh, torque that you have in the crown is going to be less torque in the roots. Less torque in the roots, this means that you're going to keep the roots inside the bone. And now, I want you to concentrate when you do your orthodontic treatment, the take home message of today is be very careful about your roots. Because we always are focusing on a class one molar, class one cuspid, we're focusing on, on the crowns, but sometimes we don't think what is happening about the roots. And with the outcome of the CBCT, this is one of the CBCTs that was used in the United States. This was uh, 15 years ago, almost 20 years ago from Hitachi. Back then, a CBCT machine used to cost $150,000. Nowadays, they have came down to almost $70,000, $70, thousand dollars up to fifty thousand dollars depending on the brand. With a CBCT, not only we are going to get different images, but whatever that we every every image that we measure in the CBCT is going to start to be one to one. It means even that when you uh, if, when you have a 3D image of your patient's cranium, you can actually print it, and this also helps a lot for the orthopedic surgeons to actually to practice the surgery in these printed craniums and in these printed mandibles before they actually do it in their own patients. Okay, so um, this is the interincisal angle. How can we modify the interincisal angle? Not only with a prescription that we are using. And if you think about it, 
that prescription is going to express itself whenever you fill in the slot of the, of the bracket. But you also are going to have some play. You see, we cannot insert the, the rectangular wire if the, if the slot has some play. It has to have some play, which this means, and this is the Alexander friction coefficient, and I'm going to share it with you. Alexander mentions that in an 18 slot, whenever you fill the arch wire with a 70 by 17, 17 by 25 degrees, that the, the arch wire is going to is going to have 0 0.001 inches of a millimeter of play. This allows for plus minus four degrees of torque. Okay, so if you have a, a prescription with 18 degrees on the centrals, this means that the highest uh, manifestation of these degrees are going to be 14, not 18 degrees. And this is what the, the torque is applying to, run, to the rules. Okay, now um, going further more. Uh, okay. Uh, how are we going to position the roots inside the bone? If you think about it, this tooth in black, it, will, it used to be the old orthodontic treatment, where it looks like when they did extractions, I, I tell my patients that it seems like someone put a vacuum in their throats and it sucked all the, all the teeth inside, inside the, the mouth. And you, you could see from the vocal, it looks very nice, but actually if you touch your patients, you can feel all the roots. This is so much negative, uh, negative root torque, and this is, uh, and, and this uh, negative, I'm sorry, negative ground torque will create more positive root torque, and this will bring the root sides out of the bone. This would be a Caucasian tooth, and in blue, this would be a Latin American tooth. What I'm trying to tell you is that always we try, we have to have the roots inside the bone. What happens in the lower incisor? When we have the lower incisor. Okay, what does uh, Tweet tell us? Tweet tells us that we have to have a 90 degree lower incisor in relation with a mandibular plane. But like I mentioned you before, this can be 90 degrees and here also we can have 90 degrees with a tooth outside the bone. In orthodontics, we have two horseshoes of bone in which we have to correct the crowding and we have to correct the malocclusion and we have to correct these two horseshoes, okay? There's no, we have to also respect the arch form, we cannot overexpand. When we overexpand, then everything is going to tend to collapse and this is not going to be stable, okay? Think about the roots. Now, if we made a flap in all of our patients, if, you, if we will expose the bone in all of our patients before starting the orthodontic treatment, I can assure you that we will be very afraid to put the brackets. Depending on the biotype of our patients, okay? There are some patients that they could have good bone thickness, you know, here in front of the roots of the low incisors. But what happens when this biotype is very thin, okay? When we don't have enough bone, what would we do in this case of patients, okay? There are studies made by a um, periodontist in, uh, in Mexico that he opened a flap before starting the orthodontic treatment and you can start seeing the, the fenestrations and the essences. So imagine what, if, what will happen if we will start moving the roots. Now, if you have this kind of patients that the biotype, you know, you have here very thin bone, what you can actually do before starting the orthodontic treatment is go ahead and put some bone graft. Take a look at this case, okay? This is a, a case that they were do, going to do corticotomies, and in another occasion, if they invite me again, I will talk to you about corticotomies. But take a look here, how this patient before, they, uh, they already put the brackets, and take a look at these fenestrations, okay? And this is before the orthodontic treatment. Now, what will happen if you think about it, if we over-inclinate the, 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 the crown, when we have too much uh, torque, or what happens if you have also too much negative torque? Also, we will lose that cortical plate. So, like I mentioned, you whenever you have a, a patient with a very thin bone on the on the cortical, 
you have to start and put some uh, bone grafting there before uh, even starting the orthodontic treatment. Now, SAD, you know, in the United States, they always tend to abbreviate everything, and it's called selective alveolar decortication. You see these micro perforations, I'm going to go back. You see these little micro perforations. Whenever they do the corticotomy in between the roots, they also do micro perforations in the bone. This will augment the surface of the lesion because we're causing a lesion on the bone, and this is going to help to move the teeth with less orthodontic forces. We are not going to apply more orthodontic forces, first of all, because already the patient is periodontally compromised, and second of all, this is going to help for uh, a faster uh, orthodontic treatment. Now, what they claim to do with the corticotomies, of course you're going to, to do less orthodontic force, but what happens with your patients? Because sometimes your patient, they ask you, you know, doctor, I want an orthodontic treatment, I want it nice, and I want it fast, and I want it cheap. And I tell them, I can do it very nice, I can do it very fast, but I cannot do it cheap, okay? It's going to cost you. So, uh, going back to the side, to the selective alveolar decortication, um, after the bone. This to be sure that we will have some good bone thickness. We augmented the thickness of the bone, and then we can be a little bit uh, in a safe position uh, to, to do the orthodontic movements. Of course, after you reposition the flap, and then you can be in a safe position. Now, again, talking about uh, the interincisal angle, and I would like to move, I don't like to, to be like here, but with one hand, I will have to hold on the, the microphone, and with this, I would like to move. Okay, we already talked about the interincisal angle. Now, how is the interincisal angle be uh, expressing itself in the aesthetic part of the patient. Well, the lip support, the, the lip support of the upper and lower lip support is made, it is, it's made by, or, or, or it's focused on the position of the upper incisor. Whenever you have a class one patient, the upper and lower lip are going to be supported by the position of the upper incisor. But this has to do also with the interincisal angle. So when some uh, orthodontic companies, they claim that you have a dish in a concave profile. It's not about destruction. And destructions, they are...